Robert has a daughter, Chelsea, and she is coming to spend two weeks with him. And his brother, who he stays with, does not want her in his house. Since I have an extra bedroom, I have offered it to him, basically saying, since Corey is coming to stay with me, we can just do stuff together. That way you do not have to worry about where you will stay with her since it is only for two weeks. We are having a great time. We took all the kids, including Garrett and Ryan, jet skiing, and other things around town. Corey and Chelsea get along great. Tonight, as Chelsea was getting ready to leave, to go back to her mother's, her mom called and told Rob, it is your turn to keep her. I will send her things. His brother has not given in on letting his daughter stay with him. I really don't understand why he has a problem with Chelsea. No child should be blamed for their parents' issues. I cannot put them on the street. So I suggested they stay here for a bit until he can decide on what to do and save up. We have decided, since the kids get along, we will get a bigger place and just live together. There is a lot of activity going on at the park across the street. The kids are already over there trying to see what is happening. A little while later, there was a knock at my door. It was a woman named Lori. She is from the church called Potter's House. She says it's not associated with T.D. Jakes. They are having movie night in the park, and they have food and inviting us over. Since Robert is at work, he drives for the cat bus system since he can no longer do construction. I have decided to walk over and keep an eye on the kids. I am already very leery about church, but Lori seems cool. It is November, and I am attending the AA Las Vegas Roundup as a participant from Las Vegas and Altadena 185. My friend Sabrina came out to it. She is one of my best friends from 185. She does my hair while she is here. That is how we became friends. She is a hairdresser, and she had asked if she could do my hair. I do not let anyone do my hair since Spencer. And it took her a lot of convincing. But the thing that made me try her was the way she could do her own hair. I would watch her, and if she could do her own hair that way, and it looks like that, maybe she is as good as I hope. When I was living in California, she would do my hair every month, and I would get a really good discount because I was also a walking advertisement for her. Most of the time, I wore a shoulder-length mushroom with a side part. Sometimes I would wear a style picked by her, like box braids, so I could promote it. We had fun when she came. The following year, Valencia came out to see me. Yes, that Valencia. One year after I had left Joel, we had ended up on the same committee for a function. 
there was no way to participate and not talk to each other. So we started talking one day when we both got there early. By the end of that day, we were best friends. I went to stay with her at the hotel and stayed the whole time during the roundup, Thursday to Sunday, except for at night where I stayed in Dwight's room. We have a hit and miss relationship. We spend a lot of time together. We go to many meetings together. We talk on the phone. We are safe for each other. We have what I call the triple F. Friday, fun, and A. Well, you get the idea. Meanwhile, in my alternate reality, Rob and I checked out the church itself and decided we would try it for a while only because one of the members had given us a lead and a reference for a house to rent, which was right next door to them. We couldn't just move into the house and then stop going to the meetings they were going to. That would be rude. I actually had fun in the beginning. The women's group was always doing something. I used to even make the members a Christmas ornament for their trees every year. I even crocheted a chicken tree for the pastor of the church. We tried to fit in, but there was something off. They celebrated Halloween by turning the church into a haunted sin house. And the talk in what they called tongues. It just sounded like gibberish to me. They didn't believe in birth control. And I apparently was not saved enough to get the Holy Spirit, according to a few of the members. Eventually, we were talked into getting married. It was not good to live in sin. I also had an ulterior motive. I took my current husband hostage. Robert Leroy Walker is white. And I married him just trying to get my mother's approval because she liked him. When Ryan was leaving to go back to California to help take care of Joyce, And she reminded me of my friend Lori. She was my best friend from church. I had known her since we were nine. We looked a lot alike, but my mother would not let me hang out with her, with her outside the church much. One day, her mother was using ammonia on her kitchen floor. And I was told it and the gas caused the house to explode. Her mother died instantly. And Lori had third degree burns over half of her body. She did not survive. Unfortunately, not before having skin grafts done. I couldn't stay long when I got to go see her. They kept her sedated when my mom told me she died I did not understand she did not explain what death was my mother passed in 2001 I celebrated I was so happy to see her dead I also didn't get her approval as a matter of fact, she disowned me in her will after her death. Shortly after I found out through the paperwork I was left, along with my piano, that she knew more about my birth family than she let on. I found out that I was born in Elmhurst Hospital 
in Queens, New York, under the name of Female Sadler. This was not as bad as finding that the birth certificate she gave me when I went to get my first job was a fake. It was worse. Apparently, the so-called adoption she said she did was never finalized. I tried contacting a lawyer on the paperwork, but the number has been disconnected and I could not find another phone number. Ultimately, I became obsessed with finding my parents and wanted to learn who I was. The year 2002 was not a good one. This complicated relationship with Dwight spanned years, even when I am with Robert. I am his secretary for his audiovisual business, so he stops by the house every other week or so. Rob became very angry and started taking it out on Chelsea. In August, I had my first heart attack. It was not like anything I had ever felt, and that was saying something. In 1993, I had a pain in my side, and instead of going to work, I went to the hospital. It saved my life. My appendix needed to come out. Later that year, I had a funny feeling in my left collarbone area every time I breathed in. I was taken to the hospital and found out my lung had collapsed. I actually laughed when the doctor first told me. Lungs just don't collapse, but mine did. A total of three times within 18 months. This was different. I am nauseous, sweating, my jaw hurts, and it went down to the center of my chest. The paramedics thought I had an upper respiratory infection because I look too young to have a heart attack. I am 37. They took me straight to the OR after the EKG because I was definitely having what they called a widow maker. One of the doctors was Dr. Kathleen Benson. She told me that I should have went to emergency when I first started feeling pain in my jaw, which had started two weeks ago, before my heart attack, I was released a week later. Another seven days, and I was sitting in a jail cell. The night before, Robert was in a rage at Chelsea. When I tried to calm him down, he turned at me. And he approached, I threw a cup of coffee I had at him in self-defense. It missed him and hit the wall. I told the kids to call 911 because I could not calm him down. After they arrived, one white cop, one black cop. They talked to me, then him. The white cop went to arrest Rob. But the black cop said, hold on, let me talk to him for a moment. And then went to the backyard with Rob. Five minutes later, he came back and at the surprise of everyone, arrested me, claiming since I had actually threw the coffee, he believed that I was the one that started the fight. Even the kids protested. Neighbors even came out to protest when they saw them putting me in the car, that they were taking the wrong one. I sat handcuffed to a bench for a very long time because they didn't know really what to do with me since I had just had a heart attack the week before. Sitting there with a big pill case of medicines I had to take, 
I was released 12 hours later. When I went for my court hearing, the case was declined. Joyce had two aunts, Aunt Harriet and Betty. Harriet lived in Riverside with her husband, Elmer, when I met them. We used to drive out there twice a month on Sundays after church if there was no church function going on and on Labor Day and Memorial Day. I would get to watch the Twilight Zone marathons while she cooked. She taught me how to make corn pudding and monkey bread. There was a store in the community and we would always go and get an Eskimo pie ice cream bar. She was about 70 when I met her. She has already died. Aunt Betty was about 60. She is flamboyant, and I loved being around her. She had waist-length silver hair, big dangling earrings, high heel shoes, and mini skirts. Her passion was to care for severely mentally challenged children, the ones that had been abandoned by their birth parents. I would spend the night at her house at least once a month. She always made monkey bread, but she cut her pieces into diamonds instead of circles like Aunt Harriet did in the way she had taught me. And she uses margarine in place of the butter that Aunt Harriet used. And they compete against each other. They each think that their monkey bread is the best. To be honest, Aunt Harriet's is the best. Monkey bread is my signature passion. It is nothing like the cinnamon stuff they call monkey bread today. When I was 10, I was selling loaves every Thanksgiving and Christmas for $25 a loaf. By the time I thought of asking if she knew the truth behind my adoption, I found out that she had died earlier in the year, which is now 2003. Rob and I went to Utah for his family reunion. Conventions in San Diego, Laughlin, and a road trip to Salt Lake City. That summer, Corey ran into a burning home in our neighborhood. An elderly couple lived there. He saved their lives. He was on the evening news that night. It got to the point that the kids and I didn't trust him. The older Chelsea got, the more angry he got. The final straw was when one evening she was not moving as fast as her father wanted her to go. And he got up, picked her up, and threw her against the solid oak bookcase we had in the living room. When he started going for her again, I stepped in front of her, and he went to hit me. And Corey stepped in front of me. And he started punching my 13-year-old son like he was a grown man. I tried to pull him off my son, and he threw me across the kitchen. I picked up a skillet and hit him on the back of his head. We did not call the police that time because of what had happened the last time. Somehow... We ended up with a victim advocate in a court case to testify against him in a domestic violent and child abuse case. He tried to intimidate us into not testifying. But once Chelsea and Corey found out that they would get paid for just showing up, there was no stopping them. We were told since so many women and children end up not showing up out of fear, they paid us for incentive to come and testify. When we walked into the building that morning with our attorney, 
and our advocate. Rob's attorney quickly walked over to us and said, Robert will be pleading guilty, so there will not be a trial. Chelsea was temporarily put in my custody. His parents did not want her. Her mother did not return my calls. And that left me with trying to find and locate his daughter's grandmother on her mother's side so that I could send her to live there while I filed for divorce. Within two months, she was living with her. I stayed in the house another month before I decided to move back to California, but that would cost money. Dwight introduced me to Eddie, who was opening an escort service and needed someone that could help run the office and handle the girls. Yes, I am no saint, and yes, I made money setting women up on dates with men. I will never regret that time, because for the first time in many years, I actually started caring about other people besides myself. My AA big brother Philip, Eddie, and myself would go to lunch at Lou's Diner and then on to the office. We developed a bond that I will never forget. After doing this for a while, I got to know the girls and it started affecting me. I started to care for the ones that had problems with drugs and alcohol, and my spirit would not allow me to continue. The final issue that convinced me to stop was when my daughter came to me wanting to work for me. Along with other issues that had started, since other services were starting to get raided, we all agreed to close the doors. We remained very good friends. Lou, or Lourdes, and I hang out anytime she is off work. She is in the U.S. Navy. I met her in 2004 through Buddy. He was also her sponsor and was hoping that we would get along. Buddy became my sponsor after I saw him speak at a meeting. He ran the late lunch bunch meeting. I went on any day I was not working. We had a lot of long conversations before meetings. Many times people would show up early to play dominoes and I would sit there playing and talking just as much mess as them when I won. Because it became so routine that when new people would be shocked at the language used in front of me. Curtis, one of the old timers, would just respond, Sure, but she's one of the guys. We went to meetings and different shows. We would go get our nails done and just hang out. You did not see one of us without the other. Lou also was always there for me when I needed help. <laughs> 